Hey, thank you for joining us today. This presentation is one of several presentations that are being offered as part of ISU Open Education Week. We call it ISU OER Week 2024. We invite you to attend the other presentations this week. I believe there's only one left tomorrow. You can see um, the link to our library news blog with links to the other presentations and they are being recorded and being uploaded as they um, render uh, to our YouTube channel. And I'm going to go ahead and submit that link into the chat now so that you can have that for your reference. And uh, before we to begin, I just want to acknowledge <clears throat> that um, ISU is on native lands and it's an important way to honor and respect indigenous peoples um, by giving a land acknowledgement uh, and their uh, traditional territories. Forgive me, sometimes I have to find my words. The land on which Idaho State University's Book Tele campus sits is within the original Fort Hall Reservation boundaries and is the traditional and ancestral home of the Shoshone and Bannock peoples. We acknowledge the Fort Hall Shoshone and Bannock peoples, their elders past and present, their future generations, and all Indigenous peoples, including those upon whose land the university is located. We offer gratitude for the land itself and the original caretakers of it. As a public research university is our ongoing commitment and responsibility to teach accurate histories of the regional indigenous people and of our institutional responsive re relationship with them, it is our commitment to the Shoshone Bannock tribes and to ISU citizens that we will collaborate on future educational discourse and activities in our communities. And just so you know, land acknowledgements are a good way to start a conversation about what I just spoke about, and um, but it requires action to support our ongoing commitment and responsibility to tribal nations. All right, with that, um, I would like to introduce um, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> just a second, Dr. Rob Watkins, and um, in his bio that he has so graciously um, shared with me, and his work that he's been um, creating. He is a recent um, stipend recipient. And he re lives within the shadow of this beautiful um, mountainous re region here in Southeast Idaho. He works as an associate professor of English at Idaho State University. He has earned a PhD at Idaho State, uh, or excuse me, Iowa State, studying writing, technical communications, and rhetoric. He teaches those very subjects to undergraduate and graduate students at Idaho State. His teaching approaches stem from his research where he focuses on the, the pedagogical intersections of multimodal composition, visual rhetoric, technical communications, and comics production. He publishes peer-reviewed articles and fictional stories from time to time. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Rob and his work in um, open educational resources. All right, I thank you so much. I did not I hope I did not botch that up too greatly. It was great. You did awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, is it cool if I share a slideshow? Is that fine? Yes, please do. Okay, cool. Let me, oh, I can share it. Cool. All right. Let's put it into uh, presentation mode. Why can I always, I always know how to do it and then I always forget. Let's see. Where, I do the oh, there thing. it is. Okay, there it is. Okay. Um, are you seeing this and the next slide? Is that the view you're seeing or is that my view? I see the presentation view. Okay, cool. That works out fine then. Uh, all right. Yeah, let me let me talk a little bit about um, my experience with OER. So just, you know, disclaimer, this is just my experience with it. So don't take anything I say too, too seriously, I suppose. Um, but I have been grateful to have this type in this year. 
Uh, so on the menu today, we're going to just briefly talk about a few things, just my history with OER, researching OER, good parts, less good parts, some concerning parts, but also where I think we're going in the future. And don't get too stressed about the less good or concerning. They're short and they're not that big of a deal. So it's mostly a positive look at the situation if you're looking to get into it. So let's start with um, my history. So I um, have been doing this for, for, for a minute. I started in grad school, actually, when I first started grad school. I started grad school on a whim because I just didn't know what else to do at that moment in my life. And one of my very first professors introduced me to um, this concept back in 2006. So what she introduced me to were open access journals. Um, so early on, I was really interested in these two journals, the Kairos Journal and Writing on the Edge Journal. Um, they're both open access. They're not the only open access in my profession, but they are two interesting ones. Kairos was all about web text, which, you know, 2006, 2007, 2008 was still kind of an exciting thing. Um, web text have kind of died, unfortunately, but they were cool for a minute. Uh, but anyway, both of these journals are open access, and I was able to early on get interested in them and publish in Kairos, uh, which helped me decide, okay, maybe I'm going to do this. So early on, right from the beginning, the thing that kept me going in academia was open access. Um, <clears throat> but as I started teaching, uh, that was actually before I was teaching, I started to get more into online readings. And this isn't necessarily always OER, but I think sometimes we get a little stressed about what OER means, but it can be as simple as doing things like bookmarking good readings. Um, so you can always use Wikipedia. I still use RSS feeds. Um, I don't know if any of you remember what RSS feeds are, but essentially if you ever looked at the bottom of a web page, they used to have like a little, almost like a reverse uh, Wi-Fi symbol and you can, and they still exist. You can add them to an RSS feed. So I keep an RSS feed going. It's how I read most news. That way I'm in control of it instead of any sort of social media um, aggregator or anything like that or Google or whoever. Um, but by doing that, I'm able to have access every day. I read lots of things that I add to a bunch of bookmarks that I then keep track of for all of my students. Uh, Reddit is also a good place. And also just other open access and open education sources. All of these have been able to, I have inside of my computer, I have, I have bookmarks on every subject that I can cover. And then every year when I go to teach a new subject, I just go to them and I'm like, okay, here's this, this, and this. And because of that, I've been able to avoid using readers of sorts, which are a big deal in English. Um, I don't know how much they are in other professions uh, for about 15 years because I always kind of felt like they were kind of a weird waste of money personally. Um, there's also OER adjacent stuff is what I'd call it. And this is just stuff like low cost textbooks that I was getting interested in early on. One of the ones I've used for years is professional writing and speaking when I teach business communication. This is a low cost textbook that's almost an OER. It's only like $20, um, which I have no problem with because the this keeps the, the writers able to cover their costs and such things. So I usually, I like some of these low cost textbooks. Um, just considering these things, you can, you can do OER adjacent work when you're deciding your textbooks. You can always reach out to authors too. So recently on the ATTW listserv, which is a listserv that I'm on, Associated Teachers of Technical Writing, we had a whole conversation about a certain book. Well, we, I wasn't a part of it. I was a lurker, like I always am. But there was this whole conversation about what, how to use, um, I think it was a proposal book. And one of the authors got on and said, hey, this is his name, last name is, his name is Richard Johnson Sheehan. He's like, you know what? The thing is, if you reach out to me, I can give you free copies of these books. Uh, I'm in the process now of working with the publisher because the price was too high. And so I'm redoing a third edition, which will be much more affordable. But in the meantime, I'm giving this out for free for students. And this is surprisingly common. If you are on listservs, you can always be have your ears open to this because a lot of the times the authors are more interested in the in the knowledge and at least um, getting that out there without the publishers making that fortune. Uh, but then the actual OER, what I'm using this semester is in my 3307 um, class, which is technical communication. This is what I got the stipend for. And I'm using two books right now, Technical Writing and Open Technical Communication. Uh, they are both completely open and free, and they're really good sources. Uh, in my first year writing, I and other books, other classes, I've often used Open English at Salt Lake Community College, which is local, which is kind of fun. It's not that far away, and it has a lot of great stuff in there, too. 
Uh, if you're wondering how to find OER, probably a lot of you are experts at this point, but if you're not, or if you ever do doing, there's not that much to it. A lot of times you can just search the internet and find it. And like I said earlier, get on some listservs. A lot of times this topic will come up, at least in my field, maybe that's not common across all listservs, but it is at least in English um, and the humanities. But you can also just ask colleagues. Another thing you can use uh, to get started is Project Gutenberg, if you're not familiar with it, that is the website for it. So if you're not uh, familiar with what this is, essentially you can go and any book that is no longer um, under specific copyright restrictions are on there. Um, they've been scanned in and these are all legal and free and great. And usually if you put in a topic, you can search, it'll show up and you can get some good stuff there too. Uh, so, okay, let's talk a bit about, for me, what I think some of the good parts of OER have been in my experience. First of all, students like it, which is nice. They like having the freeness. For most students, they don't really care what's in the textbook. In my experience, it's just whatever they have to do to get the passing grade. And so if it's free, all the better. Um, now, granted, that's not true of all of my students. Once they start to get higher, like senior level or grad students, they tend to maybe want books. But especially in the opening, the general classes, students are really into it. Another thing, our books are more concise and exact. Well, sometimes, but a lot of the times, in my experience, you can get a OER book that ends up being more what I'm interested in without a lot of fluff. A lot of textbooks end up having a lot of extra materials that I don't use or need. I know that's not true for everybody, but it is in my case. So a lot of these OER books, like the two that I that I showed earlier, they are very concise. Uh, students, it doesn't take students very long to read them, and they actually get just as much out of it in my, that I've seen than they did in any of the ones that they used to pay for. Uh, books are interactive. A lot of times they will have live hyperlinks and URLs that you can use. Um, currently in a different class right now, we're using this book. So something else sometimes that happens, this is called Design for Composition, which is a semi OER book. It's a low cost book, but it was built to be online, but it's actually printed. And so there's all of these URLs that are useless because you can't click on them in a book. But sometimes your URL books, you can, which is nice. And authors are also able to make things more up to date um, as opposed to having a whole new edition. Of course, it's cheap and or free. And then for me, at least, there's no pesky bookstore deadlines. The deadlines keep getting seemingly sooner and earlier and earlier as teachers here at Idaho State, where now I've already submitted my August book request like two weeks ago. So, and you know, that means I have now six months before my class starts, where unless I want to go through the process of talking to the bookstore, emailing my students once they start registering, my books are in place, which is usually okay. But with OER, you don't have to do that at all. Um, you can change them up to the minute. Um, even if you're going to mid-semester and the book kind of stinks, you can just change. Your students aren't gonna care. And I like that. That can be pretty cool. Then also the whole process of remixing and creating a book that you want, which I haven't gotten much into, but I'm thinking about doing more. So in, in our department, we're starting to, um, we've compiled a few books for our first year writing, um, graduate students that they can use, for our graduate students to teach first year writing. I apologize, that was not very clear. Um, and so we have a couple of books and all of these are remixable. And so we're going to, at some point, go through and make versions of them that fit what our department wants. And that's cool. Uh, of course, the downside of that with some of the less good parts of OER is that is sometimes a lot more work on us as instructors to do, to do that extra step. So here's some of the less good parts. One, I'm starting to find that students are almost expecting it, and that's okay, but it's also frustrating sometimes if they are expecting it and then they have to pay for a book, it kind of makes them bitter. So it's almost like we have to really justify those books. Uh, but I don't know if that's a bad thing. It's just something that's happening. Uh, last night's story, I felt like this happened purposefully. Last night, I got an email at 11.30 p.m. telling me my, one of my students who had to write a form that was due at midnight, and of course, they procrastinated until the last 10 minutes, which, you know, students are students. But it turns out two of the links, so um, I, I should I, I could show you my page. I probably should have, but what's on there is on my Moodle page, I have the links to the books 
on the overall section. Then each week I have the specific readings that they have to do. They can click on them. But then on top of it, in the reading discussion forums, I open those links again. So it just so happened this time that I had put two links that are now dead because the book changed um, hosts and I missed those links. So this student who didn't go through a different means that they could have was really relying only on that, couldn't access the book. So the broken links is an issue with OER that you have to be aware of. Um, they're usually, you're usually able to find them again. Every once in a while, they'll just get moved from a server for some reason. So the, the, the hyperlink dies, but that's not that unusual. That happens even with all of my syllabi when I have ISU links, they'll do that as well sometimes. So it's not that weird, but it's just something that you gotta be aware of as an instructor. On the flip side of what I said, they can also be less precise and too broad. I mean, some of these OER books are a thousand pages and it's because they're meant to be remixed. So that can be overwhelming. And then also sometimes there's a lack of supporting materials. However, that's not always the case. So if you really want to get some good um, OER books, for example, the open technical communication book that I'm using, you have access to quizzes and additional assignment descriptions that the authors have offered. So this is kind of a, of both things. It's something to be aware of if you're looking at OER books that sometimes, you know, if you want that additional um, comfort and and protection that we get as, as teachers when we're using a publisher's book, you might not get it. However, it does exist and there are plenty of OER books that use it. So that is some of the less good. Like I told you, they were too, too concerning. And here's just a couple of concerning parts of OER to me. And that, let me explain what I mean by this. It's not OER at all because I love OER. I love open access. I'm really, really into open access. Um, I, but that's a whole separate, different subject. But open access journals um, where we're doing peer reviewed research um, are tending to become more and more of the norm in my field and discipline, but they still have a long ways to go. Um, and I think there's a lot of good in open access. But some of the concerning parts to me is I'm going to call this the scapegoat nature. So what I've been seeing happening a little bit, um, which is a flip side of some of the positives, is it's almost as if the rising costs of education, tuition, fees, cost of living, and all of these things are all being simplified to being books fault. So the really thing that's hurting students are those extra, those extra costs for books, um, which isn't untrue. But I also feel like it's maybe making something seem a little bit unfair where, where a textbook can, especially for early junior faculty, um, adjunct faculty, graduate faculty, a, a well made textbook that a publisher's created with supporting materials can be a lifesaver. And so if a teacher uses that now, that's almost like they're starting to feel guilt and shame for it as opposed to using OER. So I don't love that nature of what's happening. And I don't know if that, that might go away. And the small other thing is I feel like this is slightly leading to the death of expertise across um, the country that we've been watching happening. And what I mean by that simply is one of the nice things about textbooks over the years is it allowed a lot of experts and teachers and underpaid faculty members to be able to make a little bit of extra income by using their expertise in the print world as artists, as writers. And so OER, sometimes maybe we tend to devalue our work because we're offering it at cost or free. But like I said, those aren't deal breakers at all, to me at least. So the way I see OER for the future is I love OER and I don't always use it, um, but I think that it's super valuable. Um, so those things I said, the concerning parts, those are just small, those are institutional. And I think they're just little hiccups that are gonna work out. Um, and there's other ways around it, which I think is fantastic. So for example, one of the things I would say is consider affordances. Um, affordances um, is a subject that comes from human-centered design and multimodality. And what it means if, you, if you're unfamiliar is essentially like, it's almost just like a more fancy way of saying pros and cons. So just consider what OER offers. So for me, a lot of what OER offers outweigh the benefits of me having a student pay for a textbook in, mo in many situations. And so I think that's wonderful. Um, a lot of the OER books I use are being used from funding so that we're not worried about that expertise being death that are coming from funding towards these authors in other ways. And I think that's fantastic. 
So you can consider these elements when you're choosing your OER or your open access, where, where it's coming from. Is it gonna help the students? Is it good? And if not, maybe a low cost textbook might work well before we start jumping into some of the pricier textbooks. And as a brief caveat, um, I think it's important to note that in my profession in English, a lot of textbooks are cheap. So it's, it's a lot different scenario than maybe if you were in the business department or in engineering where some of these textbooks cost, you know, three figures or more. Um, a lot of our textbooks are between 20 and 40 dollars or 50 dollars so it's not as pressing so i feel like we have a little bit more leeway so i just, i think that's important to note so i would say consider the affordances i would say consider teachers um, and what i mean by that is just consider who the authors are make sure that you're using solid sources reach out to these authors typically they will work with you they will give you materials they will be happy to work with you and like i said the other thing is is consider pay um and what I mean by that is I'm so grateful to have gotten this stipend. And I think there's lots of opportunities like this, which I think is what counteracts any of my concerns with any of the OER stuff is that I think we are being um, compensated in all kinds of great ways to use it. So I think OER has a fantastic future. I think open access journals are also have a great future. I also see a hybrid coming up of just lower cost textbooks mixed with OER resources. Um, using OER resources in combination with a printed textbook or using an OER textbook in conjunction with a printed book. For example, say I'm in an English class and I wanna teach um, some sort of art in be it narrative nonfiction, be it creative nonfiction, be it novel, be it a comic book, then I'm off, I will feel a lot better helping my, having my students buy a book um, that is like a comic book, for example, which I use a lot in my classes, if I'm on the flip side offering the theory as an open education resource for them so that it doesn't make them feel too taxed with the price. So I think OER has a bright future and I'm excited to be a part of it. And I'm super grateful to have the stipend to, to be here because I think OER is, is great and I hope to keep using it and finding out how to do it and to do new and exciting things with it. So thank you. And let me stop sharing that. Laura, you're still muted. You're still muted, by the way. Sorry. Oh, pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> I tend to jump in, so I have to mute myself just to stop myself from jumping in. Wonderful. Let's open this up to Q&A. And I have some questions prepared if, if um, to start us off, if, if nobody's raring to go. Well, I have a question. Um, thanks, Rob. I appreciated your presentation. Yes. Really, I'm really interested in how the different disciplines are able to make use of OER um, or not. Yeah. I appreciate that, that yours can. Yeah, thank you. Me too. <laughs> um, I did have a question, and it's just in my office, I have this massive ceiling fan going, and I can't hear everything. So I want to ask you to repeat, if you wouldn't mind, repeat what you said about the consider pay slide. Because I just didn't oh. hear it very well. No, that's fine. Uh, it was kind of a, I think I'd actually already answered it when I got to the slide. I'm like, oh, I already said this. And so I just kind of breezed over it. All I meant by it is, I think as we're going forward, forward with OER ideas, I think it's important that we continue to give feedback and support to the institutions that are offering stipends, to um, any sort of grant organization that's offering authors um, some compensation for their work um, so that it, yeah. it's able to progress. And also I think we should be aware of that as teachers in the books that we pick where, where these are coming from. That's all I meant by it. Right, okay, great, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Rob, thank you so much for your presentation. So I, I have a list of questions, but first I want to, um, with your stipend, I, I I don't want like a full report of, of what you did, but, but give us something that you found maybe the most useful in how you found implementing it in your course or, or um, how the students 
was there something innovative that you found the students really reacted to in, in your course? Yeah, that's a good question. I probably should have shown this. Let me just hurry and share what my um, page is. So this is the current, it just actually just started um, this week. It's a late eight week. So this is it, this is technical communication. So if you come down, this is like the, the textbooks, they're all right here. Um, you can click on it and it will take you to uh, this one. This is one of them, Open Technical Communications. This is one I'm telling you about that has ancillaries, a qu uh, quiz bank, grant docs. And this has been supported by lots of groups. You'll see that there's lots of authors. They're all known and well celebrated in the community. That's for a teacher side. But for the students, I think what they've been really grateful for. So if, if you come down, this is for each week I have, like, you click on that and it will take you to that week's reading. This is the reading here. Um, is they've really liked weirdly this part of it. So if we come down, I have examples. Um, these particular open education resource books have examples of some of the assignment types that we're doing. And so students can click on those. And I tell them, keep in mind, these aren't necessarily great examples or ones that meet our criteria, but hopefully they'll help you become more familiar. So mm -hmm. I don't know, for, I, that's what I've gotten the most feedback from, that they like these. Mm. and then just having the weekly thing they just click on and they're there but here's see this is where i messed up this is what i was telling you all about i have them here but then if you come to the forum um i have them also in here and i forgot to update those new ones because they had recently just changed servers by the time between i where i designed the course and when it went live so anyway i don't know if that answered your question that was actually kind of a sidestep i feel but that's that's the feedback i've gotten where where the students seem to be grateful for it no, that, that does answer my question. It feels um, maybe it's that interactive component. I know students really like having the examples to see and students will come at things as visual learners or audio learners. I saw that there was videos in that textbook as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in an English class, I know it's very textual based. Have you come um, into problems where they're uh, reading on screen or can they print it out if they choose? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think from the this point, these are mostly made to read on the screen and that has been an issue. Um, I should have gotten my low cost textbook out. So my low cost textbook recently went only online. Um, and since that's happened, I've had, which was really a, actually kind of bums me out, I've had some students reach out to me and more than you would expect who, who have told me that they have a really hard time understanding text online. And so they were wondering if they could get like some sort of an accommodation for print text, which as far as I know, there are no accommodations for that currently. I could be wrong. I had a few students try it and it didn't seem like they had an option. Um, and I think that is something to consider. So one of the cool things on that same note, the open technical communication one, here, I'll share my screen again, if you don't mind. Um, Please. Make sure I don't have any embarrassing tabs open. No, nothing too bad, I'm good. Uh, I have, okay, sorry. So if you come here to the open technical communication link, you will see that you can buy a print copy for $12.92. Um, and the, the bookstore is aware of this and they will even, they're even willing to um, stock it so students can go there. and I But I stopped doing sharing with the bookstore, not that I think the bookstore is nefarious or anything, but what I kept seeing happening is students didn't realize it was free. And so they were buying the version thinking they had to. But there are many open education resources and some printers like um, Parlor Press is one who will for a low price print the OER textbooks. If And, and some students really do prefer that. So that's a good question. And I think it is, it's it's an interesting one that we're watching right here. Since, I, since this class is tech comm, technical communication, it's not very text heavy and it's very visual. Yeah. Um, so it works okay. Cause I think they're, they're used to, I haven't had any issues with students tech comm with that, but I have in other classes. Thank you. Yeah, I've run yeah. into that with, with some of my students and had to find workarounds. Interesting, yeah, I mean, I just always chalk up to being middle aged, but I still always prefer print mm -hmm. to online. Well, not always, but for a lot of things I do. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to let someone else bring in a question. <laughs> Okay, I have one last question. You brought up Project Gutenberg. Yeah. And and I had was I had bells going off. What is this? What is this? And and I I know I should know this because I've I've been familiar in the past, but I've been having I'm I'm I it's been a while. So um tell me Project Gutenberg in terms of how you're using it OER. So to be honest. I have never used it. I just am aware of it and I know others have. So just before this class, I looked up some of my content to see what was on there. And I actually saw some stuff that seemed interesting. But then as I was presenting, I also thought, well, I'm presenting to librarians. They probably have better stuff that they're aware of. And so I probably should have put it on there that like, you know, ask a librarian. So well, see, that's why I'm embarrassed to even ask because I know that... <laughs> that I should know way more about this. And so I'm I'm starring this going, wait a second. I didn't I know we have text on there. Well, if you go to Project Gutenberg here, I'll share my screen again. Um, this is what it looks like. It looks very old. I mean, it looks like a website from 15 years ago. So I think it's been around for a minute, but I did rhetoric because I assumed that rhetoric, excuse me, would have a lot more stuff because, you know, it's a 25 year old, 2,500 year old discipline. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, what's the word? Oh, but look, uh, it has elements of style. Yeah. Yeah. So there's stuff on here that you can, that you can check out. And I don't, I mean, I'm under the impression that everything about it is above board, but I haven't gone into deep details if it is completely ethical but as far as i know it is perfect well i helped faculty with oer and that was off my radar so now it's back on oh cool good so thank you well in the interest of time and my daughter just walking in <laughs> <laughs> um i think that's it for today I'm going to go ahead yeah. and stop unless there's anybody else who has a question real fast. Thank you, Rob. I thought that was a, an interesting presentation. I really like to hear the different perspectives of how different faculty are, are using OER. And uh, you brought up some things that others haven't. So thank you. Oh, good. Thanks, Spencer. Appreciate it. <laughs> I also Perfect. was going to say really quick, Laura, if any of you do have questions you think of later, I mean, you can just email me. I'm happy to talk to you, anybody, and brainstorm if you have better ideas, too. Perfect. I'm going to um, stop the recording. And if you don't mind staying on with me, Dr. Watkins, for just a second, sure, and, and we'll close it down. Thank you so okay. much for your time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Oh, Rob, I botched your bio. We worked so hard on that, and then I still botched it. That's okay. You were fine. It was great. <laughs> I thought I you were fine. All, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to have this all open. And then I had the land acknowledgement and I would, had the bio and I was like, wait a second. And I opened the wrong email. Uh, I assumed, <laughs> I figured that's what had happened. We're like, oh, that's fine. No one will notice. I just feel I bad for it. you because you did all that work. You actually wrote it. So I felt bad for you because you did the work. So, well, uh, was it okay? Did it come across okay? Yeah, you, you were think? great. Yeah.